Hello and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. If you are a soybean farmer, one of your biggest questions going into 2021 could be, should I plant enlist or maybe it's extend or maybe it's extend flex, what do I do? Well, today we're gonna talk about the successes and the failures with the enlist soybean system. Well, if you wanna have successful soybeans or really any crop, one of the nutrients that you have to manage is magnesium. It's actually, I'll give you a little teaser, the center of the chlorophyll molecules. If you want your crop to be good and dark green and really produce some yield, this is one you have to dial in on your farm. We'll talk about magnesium on today's show. Later in the show, we've got a tough to control weed of the week for you. We've got an iron talk as well, but first, here's this week's Farm Basics. Stop losing money from your stored grain with the Enzone Fan Control System from Farm Shop MFG. The Enzone monitors outside conditions to run your fans so your grain naturally reaches ideal temperature and humidity. For more information, visit farmshopmfg.com. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk a little about farming after dark. One thing about this time of year is we get less hours of sunlight. And when farmers are trying to do some harvesting, well, they run out of daylight pretty quick. So you may say, oh, is it just because we only have a few hours of daylight that farmers are harvesting at night? Uh, that's part of it. But one of the bigger reasons is just that there's a limited window of time for farmers to harvest the crop at the right moisture percentage. So when we're looking at the grain, when they're hauling it to a grain elevator or an ethanol plant or even to a livestock feeder, they want the grain at a certain percentage so it can store or process correctly. So for farmers, when they get the grain to that certain moisture percentage, they may only have a few days or even a few hours to get it harvested timely. So when it hits that stage, farmers are gonna roll whether it's day or night. All right, one of the things I like about farming at night is the wind is a lot calmer. Where we farm in South Dakota, the wind seems to be blowing really hard a lot of days during the fall. October is one of our very windiest months, so I hate that. But a lot of times we get to evening, and especially overnight, the wind's much calmer. Now, the biggest downside I see to farming after dark is safety. Safety is a huge factor on farms all over the world. This is one of the riskiest professions, and I'll just be upfront with you, there are a lot more accidents after dark than there are in the daylight. So fortunately, we have a lot better technology today than we used to, a lot better cabs. You can see a lot more things, much better lights. We're, we're so happy that a lot of these manufacturers of equipment have put a lot better technology into their lights, halogen lights for the most part, and lights almost everywhere. So I really like that. Even around our farmyard, I have lights on every building. I have them on every night. I, I mean, it's actually really good compared to what it used to be. But nevertheless, we as farmers just have to be a lot more careful at night because we can't see everything everything like we can in the daylight. Also, communication has greatly improved with cell phones and radios that farmers are using to be able to talk to one another, to just know who's in the field, where they're at, what they're up to. That's really handy because you don't want any kind of surprise at night, and it's certainly a lot easier to happen. The other thing that's nice is GPS guidance and auto steer technology and many of the pieces of equipment that farmers are using. So let's just take, for example, two brothers maybe working in the same field with two different tractors and, and implements. Well, we know exactly where each other is at and we also can see where we've been and where we haven't been much easier than if we were just doing it by uh, trying to look around and see what's happening in the field. So it keeps us away from each other and it also keeps us on the same path so we don't run into each other. Okay, a few last quick things. Spraying at night is actually just fine. I don't have a big problem with that as long as the temperature is okay and you don't have a bunch of dew on the leaves. In terms of doing tillage at night, that's actually preferred because there are some weeds that, believe it or not, just flipping them over in the daylight, that's enough to trigger germination. So if you don't want to trigger germination, you do your tillage at night. That can really help. I guess the last thing that I'll leave you with, with all, all this night work that farmers have to do, is when we start talking about working at night, very often people are tired at that point. And our dad would very often say, hey, look, we're not gonna work 24 seven, and the reason why is safety. I don't want you working more than about 16, 18 hours a day, just because when it's dark and you're tired, now that's when accidents really start to happen. So we would just say, if you are a farmer, 
please be careful. Please use your head. Please try to get some good night's sleep throughout harvest in order to be safe. But one thing that's definitely not safe when we're out in the fields is this weed. Can you identify our Weed of the Week? Who says harvest should be the only rewarding part of the season? Sure, ending a successful year of planning and planting is a very gratifying moment. But with the Bayer Plus Rewards program on your side, it doesn't have to be the only one. By helping you earn and redeem cash back on seed, herbicides, and other eligible products you use throughout the entire season, you can reap the benefits all year round. So contact your retailer to learn how to get more from your crops and put more in your wallet. Bayer Plus. Rewards are always in season. Give it all away. Find love and give it all away. Call it a day. One more post. One more bucket. There's always one more to be done. One more field. To be earned. To be found. For us, it always has been. And always will be. One more bushel. When you apply phosphate fertilizer, it binds to calcium in the soil, becoming calcium phosphate, essentially tooth enamel. How much of this tooth do you think will become available to your crop? NutriCharge doubles your phosphate availability by protecting it from calcium fixation. Pentair Hypro Ultra Low Drift Nozzles are your ideal choice for the Enlist E3 herbicide system. With coverage comparable to flat fans and with 90% less drift, ULD nozzles meet all required standards for Enlist applications and provide optimal performance of contact herbicides. Learn more at pentair.com slash hypro. Success isn't just about maintaining your operation, how you make out for the season, or how much you can get from each acre. It's about doing precisely what needs to be done to feed your crop and grow your legacy. All the way down to the last drop. AgroLiquid Precision Crop Nutrition. Apply less, expect more. Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. At the beginning of the show today, I said for Enlist Soybeans, we talk about the successes and the failures and you may be wondering what those failures are. We'll get to that in just a minute. Let me first explain what Enlist is. It is a newer technology that allows a farmer to spray glyphosate, glufosinate, which would be Liberty, and then also the new 2,4-D, just the new 2,4-D. That would be called Enlist 1. So we're super excited about this particular trait because it's actually been planted on our farm for about six years now. We love the yields. There's a lot of potential with this, but we just want to make sure you know the downsides to it as well before you go planting a bunch of Enlist soybeans on your farm. Certainly we expect Enlist acres to increase again this year due to the success that Brandon's talked about here just a little bit in the past few years. Growers are excited about many things with those varieties, but I just want to say this, here's the first caution I would give you. This trait, as Brian mentioned, has tolerance to glufosinate or Liberty, glyphosate or Roundup, and this new 2,4-D. So you may be thinking, well, hey, I don't have to worry about a pre-emerge herbicide. I got all these options. I can spray post-emerge. And they are great options post. But I'm just going to say this, when we've had weed control issues across the country with Enlist, it's almost always come where we either didn't get a pre-emerge residual on or we didn't get enough rainfall to activate a residual product that got put on after planting. So we want you to use the three pre strategy. This is something that will make you more yield and also take away a lot of the stress and a lot of the risk that you may be taking with Enlist if you're relying on post-emerge control. And by three pre's, we mean Metribuzin, a PPO, either Valor or Authority, and one of the yellows like Prowl or Trifluralin. 
Okay, one of the other things that we've seen in terms of a failure, a problem with the Enlist system, is the antagonism toward the volunteer corn herbicides. So if you're going to rotate, most likely, you're following corn with soybeans. You go out there, you plant Enlist soybeans, you got some volunteer corn, you say, oh, no big deal, I'll throw in my Fusillade, I'll throw in my Secure, or whatever it is. Unfortunately, though, there is a lot of antagonism between 2,4-D and any of those grass herbicides. What we found is the Assure 2 and Secure, that whole family, it just doesn't work very well. Some people will say Fusillate also doesn't work very well. I would agree with that to some degree. When you're mixing with Enlist. When you're mixing with Enlist. But here's how we encourage you to get around that. First of all, spray Liberty first. Okay, Liberty will probably kill a lot of the volunteers and you could throw a volunteer corn herbicide in with Liberty. So do that first. If you are going to spray Enlist 1, whether it's with Roundup or, or not, doesn't matter, we would probably tell you bump the rate a lot. Use the highest labeled rate instead of the lowest labeled rate on whatever volunteer corn herbicide you want to use, and then make sure you're throwing some crop oil along with it just to spike up that activity of the volunteer corn herbicide. The other challenge that we have spraying Enlist post-emerge is some of the tank mixability, especially when we look at different forms of glyphosate. When we're mixing glyphosate in the tank with Enlist 1, and we're putting in some ammonium sulfate to try to make that Roundup and the Enlist 1 work better, all of a sudden we've seen some tank mixing issues. Now, here's where we've seen the problems. We've seen problems where we're using high rates of ammonium sulfate, so 17 pounds per 100 gallons or more, so one thing you could do is you could consider, well, maybe I'll just cut the AMS back to the lower end of the labeled rate at eight and a half pounds per 100 gallons of water. But the other solution to this, and I feel the better solution, is just adding more water to the tank. If you're spraying 10 gallons of water per acre or less, well, that's where we've seen most of these problems. When we get to 15 gallons of water per acre or even 20, we've hardly ever seen these types of compatibility issues. Okay, and I don't like that either. Honestly, if it's me, I would go 10 gallons of water to the acre. I just wouldn't go down to the five or the seven. Once you get to at least 10, that helps. But the big thing is put lots of water in first, get your ammonium sulfate in, get your Enlist in, then throw the glyphosate in at the very end, just as you're finishing up the tank, then throw that in. Usually that makes the difference. I'd also tell you compatibility agents haven't really worked to fix this whole thing. So you can't just say, well, I'll just throw a compatibility agent in. That'll solve my problem like it does for everything else. For whatever reason, it doesn't work with this particular combo. Earlier, I'd mentioned spray Liberty first, then spray the Enlist 1 and glyphosate later. Part of the reason why I want you to do that is spray coverage. This is another issue that we've seen in the Enlist system. People haven't been used to spraying Liberty. They go out and spray Liberty when everything is big and they can't get good coverage on the weed, and they go, well, that Liberty doesn't work. No, Liberty's fantastic. There are no resistant weeds. It's great, but you have to have good spray coverage. Well, you're not gonna get good spray coverage when the beans are chest high and you're trying to blow that Liberty down underneath to kill a one inch tall weed. It's not gonna work. So spray your Liberty early when you can get good coverage, then come back with your Enlist 1 and glyphosate later. And by the way, Enlist 1 and Roundup are labeled up to R2, that's full flower. Liberty is only labeled to R1, that's first flower. So it makes way more sense to spray Liberty first, then follow with your Enlist 1 and Roundup later. When we talk about this two-pass approach, that already may be disappointing you. Oh no, I thought this was my one-pass thing. No, it might not be, and it might even be a three-pass where you put down the pre, come back in with the Liberty early, and then come back with Enlist and Roundup later. And also, Brian mentioned Liberty has no resistant weeds. We do have resistant weeds, obviously, to Roundup, but there are also some resistant weeds to 2,4-D. That's why putting those two products together helps us with that, where at least we've got one mode of action that's going to be effective controlling the weeds. All right, in terms of varieties, Darren, what's the big watch out with Enlist varieties? The thing I would be concerned about is just making sure you get all the defensive traits that you need. This is a relatively new platform. It's been out now for a little while, but there still are some varieties that are great yielders, but they may miss brown stem rot, or they may not be great on white mold or sudden death syndrome. So make sure you're talking to your seed supplier about, hey, do I need to add a seed treatment for SDS? Do I need to watch out where I'm planting this bean because it doesn't have a brown stem rot resistant gene or something like that. Just make sure you're still picking defensive traits. Don't just get excited and say, you know, I want to go enlist. The weed control is great. The weed control is great, but do be careful when you're picking your varieties to make sure you get the ones that fit best on your soils. One last thing, 
Enlist Duo versus mixing your own Enlist One and Roundup. The reason why most people go Enlist One plus Roundup is it's cheaper. Name brand Roundup is at the lowest price in history, so that's the reason why a lot of people are mixing that together rather than just buying the pre-mixed Enlist Duo, which has a different type of glyphosate together with Enlist. So if you want to use that, you certainly can. Either way is fine. But whatever you do, I guess the big thing here that we wanted to tell you today is Enlist soybeans are great. It's just you've got to be a little bit careful in terms of what you use for herbicides when you spray them. There are certainly some watchouts, but the varieties are good. Just make sure you're picking the right defensive traits. But will the Enlist trade allow you to kill our weed of the week with those herbicide options? We'll talk about that coming up later in the show. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whenever you want, in your life and on your farm, Case IH AFS Connect gives you more control. Monitor your operation, manage your fleet and your farm data your way. Case IH, rethink productivity. Each year brings new and unique challenges to farming and your operation needs to constantly adapt to meet them. That's why at AgBiome, we're working every day to bring you new and better solutions, microbial-based solutions that protect your crop and help it reach its full potential. To learn more about how we're doing it, visit agbiome.com. AgBiome, feeding the world responsibly, partnering with microbes for human benefit. What I look for in a seed isn't just in the seed. It's people I trust who get me the solve without the cell. Who show me where their seed fits and even where it doesn't. Because the only innovation that matters is the one I need. With NK Seeds, progress means pushing my potential. And success matters. YieldTrack has tracks in its DNA. I have with me Matt Meyer, lead YieldTrack planner engineer from Norwood Sales. Matt, what makes these tracks so special? Well, Bill, these tracks were designed with a spherical bearing as the main pivot that allows oscillation, camber, and steering from a single mechanism. The design has five degrees of camber to match the crown of the road, resulting in a faster and cooler road transport. Yield track then uniquely locks out this camber in the field to maximize the belt soil contact ratio, improving flotation while minimizing both belt wear and soil compaction. Finally, we add an infield steering option for those who need auto guidance, especially those doing strip till, making this track system unmatched in the industry. Well, thank you, Matt. You can only get these tracks on a yield track planner. Call Norwood Sales for more information. Across the country and across county lines, no two operations are alike. You make the right decisions for the right acres, and no decision is more important than what you choose to plant. Introducing Extend Flex Soybeans, elite genetics now with the addition of glufosinate tolerance, giving you the yield you want with the choice you need. Extend Flex Soybeans. Magnesium is a tremendously important nutrient that all crops need, and all crops need a lot of it. You're going to find it at pretty high levels on most soil tests. In fact, on our farm, we'll commonly see 500 parts per million or more, and that can be great. But the number one thing we wanted to talk about today is managing the ratio of magnesium to everything else in your soil on a base saturation test. So when you're looking at a soil test, we do want to look at base saturation percentages when it comes to magnesium to help us understand, do we have enough out there? Do we have too much out there? We'd like to see that magnesium percentage be somewhere between 12 and 20%. Now, right away, you may say, well, that's a big range. What really determines if I want to be on the low end of the range or the high end of the range? And what's going to determine that is what kind of soil type you have. For example, if you've got very sandy soil, one of the challenges you have is holding enough moisture. Well, magnesium is a very small particle, and if we have more magnesium in the soil, it tightens up that soil a little bit, and you can hold more water. 
So we'd like to see that towards the 18 to maybe even 20% range on a lighter soil. If we've got a heavy clay soil, holding water is not our problem. We may be holding too much and we like to see that range down towards 12 to 14% on the low end. If you're low on magnesium, it's pretty easy to add some. There are a lot of lime sources that have magnesium, the dolomite lime. You could add magnesium sulfate. You could add magnesium sulfate in season. Darren and I were talking about low tissue test levels. If you ever see that, throw a little magnesium sulfate out, no big deal. Lots of forms of magnesium that you can apply on your farm. If you need to lower your magnesium, I'll say this. Let's say you have 40% magnesium or some ridiculous thing. That probably means you have a tight, compacted soil. We just have found, yes, it'd be nice to get that down, but it costs a lot of money and takes time. So the number one thing is fix your drainage, get some tile out there, and then to try to lower that magnesium over time, maybe add some sulfur, and then also add some calcium to change the ratio of calcium to magnesium slowly over time. Don't spend all your dollars fixing magnesium. Make sure you're fertilizing for everything else, then I'd kind of focus on magnesium. Well, here's the other thing with magnesium. If you've got too much out there, it actually raises your soil pH about 1.6 to 1 compared to high calcium levels. So a lot of times people say, oh, I have high calcium soils, my pH is up. If you have high magnesium soils, your pH goes up even more. The most important thing is just make sure you get a base saturation test on your soil test this fall so at least you know, am I too high or too low on magnesium? And then you can start slowly working on that over time. Well, magnesium is certainly an important nutrient, but it won't matter how many nutrients you've got out there if weeds take over your farm. We'll show you how to stop our Weed of the Week coming up next. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher. With unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift. And near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> Weed of the Week is a winter annual, it's purple dead nettle. Winter annuals, of course, get started in the fall by germinating right now. So it's important that you're able to identify this one, and it often gets misidentified as henbit. Yep, and the reason why is they're both winter annuals. They look somewhat similar, especially when they're small. The difference is with purple dead nettle, it has petioles and henbit does not. So I realize it's a minor thing, but that would be the difference. The good news here, Darren, is I don't really care if it's henbit or purple dead nettle. For the most part, the same herbicides will control both weeds. Well, and here's the thing too. If you have a problem with winter annual weeds, start having a fall herbicide program. If you wait till spring, good luck trying to get these things stopped when they're already well established. Okay, so what can you use to control these weeds? Uh, whether it's purple dead nettle or henbit, either way, dicamba, 2,4-D, Roundup, you could certainly do Fall Valor, Fall Authority, I got lots of different options in the fall. Spring burn down, we like it when the weather's a little bit warmer, you'll get better control. The problem, like Darren said, is the weeds can be huge by that point, so controlling them in the fall is just a lot easier. And we talk about these weeds in the spring sometimes, we say, you know, if you could have done a fall treatment, you would be much happier. Now's your shot. You may have to stop the combine for a day when you get a nice spray day to kill these things, but it's well worth it. Well, that's it for our Weed of the Week, but stay tuned, Iron Talk is coming up next. On the Soil Warrior, we have harvested the best corn we have ever harvested in the history of Renwood Farms. 
Now, I'm kind of always wanting to push the envelope to see what else I can do to help enhance that emergence. Their ride is so much smoother. Their seed placement is even better. Where we had our best emergence and we've had our best yields was where we ran the soil warrior. How much does your crop residue cost you? Over time, residue accumulates in your field, building excess carbon levels and tying up your plant available nitrogen. Residue also traps P, K, and micros and can take years to naturally become available to your crops. This is because soil lacks the diverse microbial life needed to break it all down. With Decomp, you can naturally restore life to your soils and allow the release of valuable crop fertility. Learn more at heftyseed.com slash naturals. Success isn't just about maintaining your operation, how you make out for the season, or how much you can get from each acre. It's about doing precisely what needs to be done to feed your crop and grow your legacy, all the way down to the last drop. AgroLiquid Precision Crop Nutrition. Apply less, expect more. Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. Stop losing money from your stored grain with the end zone fan control system from Farm Shop MFG. Hot spots and moisture in your bin can cost you thousands in lost revenue. The end zone monitors outside conditions to run your fans exactly when you want them to, naturally bringing your grain to ideal temperature and humidity. Master bin management with the end zone. For more information, visit farmshopmfg.com. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whenever you want, in your life and on your farm, Case IH AFS Connect gives you more control. Monitor your operation, manage your fleet and your farm data your way. Case IH. Rethink productivity. Did your planter cost you yield this fall? I'm not talking about poor or uneven emergence either. I'll explain a very common planter error that's literally leaving yield in the fields in today's Iron Talk. In some areas, the spring of 2020 was dry and the soil was light and fluffy. It was easy to have the trash whipper set a little too aggressive, at least for parts of each field. The result was building a trench with soil berms just a few inches away from the row. The plants grew very well, and in many cases, the soybeans put on heavy pod loads all the way to the lowest nodes. The problem quickly became that the combine couldn't reach those lowest nodes due to soil berms that had pushed up along the side of the rows. I see this problem every year in parts of many farms. One response I get from farmers is that soybeans shouldn't pod that low, and they should pick beans that pod a little bit higher up. Unfortunately, that's not really how it works. You see, each trifoliate on a soybean plant feeds the pods at the node that it's attached to on the stem. If you space your soybeans properly and you get sunlight down to those bottom branches, you're going to have more pods and more yield on those lower nodes that could potentially end up in your combine. That's a good thing. So how do you get those pods into the combine? First, you may consider rolling the ground to flatten out any berms that were made with the planter. In fact, you could even roll before planting to make it a little bit easier to set your planter and do a great job in the first place. Another possible solution would be to invest money in your planter and get self-adjusting residue managers or units with controls for manual adjustment from the cab. Either way, you've got a much better option than having to get out of the tractor multiple times each field to make adjustments as the soil conditions change. Walk your fields after harvest. Look at why you left some beans in the field. Then address the problem with your planter to get those free bushels into your combine next season. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. That's all the time we have for today's show, but if you're looking for more agronomic information, check out the Ag PhD radio show where we take your live phone calls each weekday on Sirius XM channel 147 at 2 p.m. Central. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD.